Well, he's indeed calling us to the cross, where at the foot of the cross we find our hope and our salvation. So how about we stand? It's great to see you this morning. Let's sing of the wonderful salvation that has been bought by his grace. Sinful sons of wrath Following a crooked road We were lost and wandering So couldn't choose righteousness We couldn't save ourselves from death The God of grace, rich in love Gave us life in Jesus By His grace, by His grace We are saved not by works or words, but by faith in Jesus' name. And all love surpassing knowledge, your grace so full and free, I know that Jesus saves me, and that's enough for me oh wonderful salvation from sin he makes me free i feel the sweet assurance and that's enough for me
Christ so precious, poured out on Calvary. I feel the sweet assurance, and that's enough for me. himself broken on that tree his sacrifice is truly enough for me well, we learned a new song last Saturday night at our family weekend away and this song causes us to cast our eyes and stop for a minute to behold him what does it mean to behold him well, I think Paul picks up on that really well in Ephesians 1 when he says I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope that you are called to, the riches of his glorious inheritance in this holy people. So let's spend time now reflecting as we pick up this song, casting our eyes upon Jesus. And he who was before there was light walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing, behold him. He who heard humanity's cry, left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us, behold him. Jesus, Son.
we give you thanks and praise that you are the Son of God. Lord, that by being the lamb that was slain, Lord, for taking our punishment on the cross, Lord, that we stand confidently before you. Lord, may our hearts and minds and eyes just behold you. Lord, may we stop in the chaos of life to reflect, to cast our gaze and affection upon the one that's worthy. Lord, may our song forever be holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty because you are worthy, Lord, to receive our praise. And it's only possible through the beautiful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Take your seats. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's great to, to see you all here this morning. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Stubbs and I uh, have the, the blessing of being able to work here uh, at the Lakes Church. I'm the uh, 10.30 congregation leader in amongst other things, also the leader of Celebrate Recovery uh, here at the Lakes Church. And it's lovely to be with you all today, uh, whether you're new or whether you know, you've been here longer than me, it is great to look out there and see so many expectant, uh, happy faces and hear our voices join together in, in all of those beautiful songs. Um, I'm not sure how your week has been. I'm not sure if you had a, a great week or whether you had a really tough week. Um, and I suppose I want to say my, my week was a, a hard week. I'm not going to go into it. Why? But just some stuff going on. And um, I want to share with you, yesterday we went, you know what, let's just get away for the day. And we drove up to Mount Toma. I don't know if you've ever been up to the Botanical Gardens there, up the Blue Mountains. And we had those fires that, that raged through Australia probably a couple of years ago now, was it? Yeah. And just to be able to stand up the top there and see all these beautiful flowers uh, just bursting forth God's colour, God's creation. But as that backdrop, all of the trees that have been burnt, they're also starting to come back to life. And I suppose it spoke to me of, of just that great metaphor that in the midst of brokenness, God's still at work. Yeah. He's raising new life. He's raised each one of us to new life. And out of that brokenness, he does bring beauty. And so if you're one of those people who's sitting in the midst of some brokenness, whether it's loss, and I know there are those in our community here who are going through that with loved ones passing away, but others, it just might be the challenges of everyday life. Let's not forget the, the, God, the God who is the God of the hilltops and the mountain experiences. He's also God when we're sitting in those valleys, when it's hard. He's there. He's still sovereign. He's working out his plans. Uh, that's what I heard yesterday, and, and that's what's on my heart to share with you this morning. And it's great to be able to do that as we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ who know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. We know the end of the story. We know who wins <laughs> And we go, you beauty, come back. Come back soon, Lord. But equally, I want to say to those of you who don't yet know him in that way, you're here for a reason. And my hope and prayer is you can hear some of that message today, that it might soften your heart. It might open it up to a conversation with someone here, someone you came with or someone up front who speaks or someone who's behind the scenes, your barista, the sound people, someone else. You ask them why you come here. What's it about? How about I pray to that end? Uh, Father God, um, on a beautiful morning like this, it's hard for us not to look out that window and be reminded that you are sovereign, you are in control, you are a God who, who brought this whole world together and the creation is a reflection of your beauty, a mere reflection of that true beauty we'll all see one day because of Jesus. Father, I pray this morning's gathering that we, we will be able to sing songs of joy, Lord, because we are a joyful people who know Jesus. I pray our time together will be one that sings those praises to you, that is a time where we can connect together as a family, Lord. Uh, and we pray that you will bless our gathering. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it's hard to not recognise spring 
Summer's just around the corner. I got up this, I got up this week. Normally, I wear a T-shirt under my shirts because I haven't got a lot of fat on the body, so I'm always cold. But this week, it was like, oh, I can sort of feel. Spring's here, absolutely, but I can start to smell summer almost. And I love summer. I love the beach. I love swimming in the beach. Um, I attempt to bodyboard. I'm not great at it, but uh, it's one of the things I get a great deal of joy from. And I was thinking, you know, summer is a great time, but summer can also be a bit of a challenge. And I thought, you know what, a good way to start to get us all ready for summer would be for me to share with you Matt's three summer life hacks okay these are my top summer life hacks for you today come along take them away with you it's a I can see some of you're excited to hear what they are now who loves going to the beach yeah okay I'm talking to those people the other people you can turn off for a minute okay now who's ever dropped lost their keys at the beach okay terrible experience who's dropped their iPhone in the sand yeah, yeah, you've done it. Yeah, you must have been dad or mum's iPhone, mate. Good luck with that one. You know what? Well, and the other one is you go to the beach and you think, where am I going to put my money so it doesn't get stolen? You know, all of that stuff. Well, I have a great summer hack for you, okay? Do you want to hit it? Look at this. What you do is you empty out your sunscreen bottle, you wash it out, stick your phone, your keys, your money in there, pop the top on it, goes in your handbag, goes in your bag. You will never lose it nor will you drop anything. Isn't that a great life hack? Yeah, that's a brilliant, okay. Okay, what about when you get home from each, who, who likes a nice cold drink on a hot summer's day? Yeah, most of you, okay, some of you just refuse to put your hand up, I can see, anyway. Um, who likes when you get home and you're hot and you think, man, I could kill for a nice cold drink and you look over and your favourite beverage is not in the fridge but it's on the ground and you forgot to put it in the fridge. Who likes that? No one likes that. So I have a life hack for you, okay? Because you whack it in the freezer, it takes like 20 minutes. It's still not cold, is it? Well, I'll tell you what, here's the next life hack. What you do is you get some paper towel, you wet it, you put it round the bottle, stick it in the freezer and dead set five minutes later, it will be ice cold. I kid you not. Is that a good life hack or what? That is a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so my top life hack, so you've, you've gone to the beach, you come home, you have your nice cold, what do we do in summer? We invite people over to our houses, don't we? Nothing better than a good Aussie barbecue. Who likes a good Aussie barbecue? Yeah, all right, I can still see some of you are never going to stick your hand up. Josh Mason, I'm watching you. You invite your friends over, but you don't invite the flies, do you? Who likes flies and their food? Are you just going to stick your hand up for everything? There's two kids at the back and one at the front. Well, I'll tell you what, here's my last best life hack for you. What you do is you get some lemons, you cut them in half, you stick cloves in them, put them out half hour before your friends come over. Not only will you get a lovely citrus smell and will it look good, but equally you get no flies. That's exactly right, buddy. So there you go. There, Matt's three top life hacks for summer. Do they leave you going, how good is that? <laughs> Absolutely. Gee, some of you are easily fooled. Because you know what? Whilst they're life hacks, let's admit it. Like that first one. Can you imagine trying to wash out all the sunscreen out of that bottle? And you'd always end up with some in there. And then you'd stick your iPhone to your ear and you'd have it on your ear. What about the fridge one? How many of you have chucked a bottle of your favourite drink in the freezer and forgotten it? <laughs> Only to the next morning be reminded by your wife, you stuck that ginger beer in the freezer again, didn't you? Because I opened it and there's ginger beer throughout the freezer. Yeah, I've done that on a few occasions. And equally, dead set that third life hack with the lemons and the cloves. I really don't know if it'd work. I wonder if it'd just smell bad look bad and you'd end up with fruit flies rather than blow flies. <laughs> That's got to be a bit... Ugh. But isn't that true? I mean, we've got these things called life hacks and why do we have them? Why are they pro prolific on the internet? Because we all want a better life. Yeah, we all want a life without the issues that life brings. We want that perfect life. We want a life without those problems or issues. Now, God's Word never says, you know, I'll take all the issues away, good, you know, jump, jump in the best 
life ever and it's all over. There will be challenges, there will be issues. But he has also, in his word, given us some great instruction about how to lead a better life. And we are going to spend a three-week sermon series on the book of Wisdom, on the book of Proverbs. And the big call in Proverbs is whatever else, get wisdom. Whatever else, get wisdom. And they're not life hacks. There's a depth to it that we are not going to be able to cover across the next three weeks, absolutely. But we intend to dive deep this week with Tim bringing a word to us to help us look at where do Proverbs come from and how might they enhance our life in the here and now as we also look to the forever life together. So that's something to really look forward to over the next three weeks. Uh, So Tim will be bringing that word to us this week, so looking forward to that. So before we go any further, there are a couple of things in the life of our church. The first one is we've got men's camp coming up, men's weekend away. I did have a flyer, to, but I left it on my seat. But Cell, give us a wave down the back there, Cell. There he is. There's, there's the man to go and see to. If you've never been on the men's weekend away, then can I encourage you to consider it? It's something I did very early on when I came to the church here. And, and I actually never looked back from there because it gave me an opportunity to talk with a bunch of blokes who were sort of similar to me and I got to know them at a better level than I'm ever going to get to know them when I just sit here on a Sunday and have a quick coffee afterwards and disappear. And there's usually some great speaker who comes along who helps us understand God's Word better. So can I encourage you to have a chat to sell? I'm happy to have a chat with you about about it as well. So that's Men's Weekend Away. Now, another thing that we've got coming up soon is Good News Week. Uh, who has heard, who, who has been to Good News Week here? Yeah, okay. Do you know what? That's not a great deal of people and that's not a judgment on anyone who hasn't been there. I reckon it's just a reality of the disruption over the last couple of years. We really haven't had Good News Week. And so I really want to stop down now. We're going to show you a bit of a video in a moment and I'm going to talk to you about what Good News Week is and try and really create that picture for you about why we do Good News Week and what occurs there. So can we run that video now? So you mightn't have heard of it, you mightn't have ever experienced it, but at the Lakes Church, this is one of our big outreach events into our community. It's from the 4th to the 6th of January... Wednesday to Friday and it includes a family fun day on that Sunday. We hold it in the first week after New Year because quite often families, parents are looking for something to do with their kids and this is a great time to keep them busy but also to teach them about God's love. So from year six to kindy you can be involved. Interactive fun program each day 9.30 till 11.30, morning tea, games, teaching about Jesus We've got a band of committed young volunteers who throw themselves into it and they all have fun. We also run an adults cafe alongside of the kids program to encourage the parents who drop their kids off to stay, have a look, think about what church is about, have a look in our ministry centre. We tend to run a number of talks and this year we're going to have a focus on new year and new start and we'll be running it in the function room and also the outdoor alfresco area. Delicious morning teas and also coffee, drinks. We're going to reach into our business community as well this year and invite them along. And we don't forget the teens. The teens program is open for those from year 7 to year 12 and it's on in the evenings. The ministry centre comes alive with lights, actions and noise. There's live music, there's talks, there's chill time, games, hangout, interactive involvement. There's milkshakes, heaps of fun. All of this is a great recipe for teenagers to hear the gospel in a relaxed and engaging environment. So that's Good News Week 2022 and it'll be coming up in January from the Wednesday to the Friday and then on the Sunday we do have the Family Fun Day. So how can you help? Well can I say if you have young children Or if you're a grandparent with young children, can I encourage you to put it in your diary now and make sure you come along? One of the old pastors here 
Uh, he's down in Wollongong now, and he said to me, Matt, he said, you've come to a Christian church. Uh, he said, there's no such thing as a sin that can't be forgiven, except if you miss Good News Week. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that one. I thought that was a really good line. It's not a sin if you can't make it. If you've got other stuff organised, then, then good luck. Uh, and I pray you have a great time. But I do know you will have a great time if you come here during Good News Week. Uh, your children will be blessed. My kids have always loved Good News Week. We did go away one year and they never let us forget it because they miss Good News Week. They miss connecting with their friends and I missed allowing them to hear the good news of Jesus. At the same time, the Adults Cafe is a great time. If you're new to church and you want to start connecting in, uh, you could be involved in that as well. I will be heading that up this year, so I welcome you to come and have a chat with me. Um, yeah, if you know other young families and you intend coming along, this is a great way for them to start to, just for kids to have fun as well and to have a bit of a break from the humdrum nature of holidays, being away from uh, school and, and at a bit of a loose end. So I ask you to whack it in your diary now and consider if you can help as well. We will be having flyers around over the next month or so which ask you about what involvement would you like to have at Good News Week. So I'd ask you to prayerfully consider that and at a minimum, if you can't make it along, can you be praying for the different groups of people in the church here who are organising Good News Week? Uh, we'll pray for that a bit later but that we have unity uh, and that also the people will be called to come along and, and perhaps hear about Jesus for the first time. So that's something that we've got coming up that's really exciting. Now, talking about exciting, I can see your kids are ready to go. We will have a five-minute break and the kids uh, and the kids only, yeah, the teens, you get to stay with us. But kids, you can head on out now, out through that back door. If you're new and you don't know where to go, one of the other parents will direct you on your way. Thank you.
I hate to interrupt those conversations. But I'm sure um, they can continue over morning tea a bit later on. But for now, I'm, I'd love it if you would, uh, if we could pray as a community and then Donna's going to read the Bible for us soon. So how about we, we pray? I'm going to read from Psalm 96, uh, a few verses from there first. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord, he made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are to be praised. You are awesome beyond our comprehension. Your power, Father, is beyond all of our imaginings. We marvel at the wonders that you've created, but we know what we see is only a very minor reflection of your total majesty and your power. And Father God, we come to you today, sinners, having done things wrong this week, having neglected those things that we should have done, and having not loved in ways you would want us to. For this, Father, we are truly sorry. And Lord, we do have confidence because you told us through your prophet Isaiah, though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red and crimson, they shall be like wool. Father, we thank you for your grace, for that undeserved love that your son Jesus by his precious blood. We thank you that you, that we can approach your throne of grace. We can approach it with confidence so that we not only may receive mercy, but Father, we also find support and assistance in our times of need. And Father, we thank you that you listen to our prayers. And today, Lord, we especially pray for those in our church who are struggling physically, uh, emotionally and mentally. For our dear sister Betty Clark, Father, who continues to struggle in her health, Lord, she is a great follower of yours. Uh, we would ask that you comfort her in her pain and give her patience as she comes to terms with her ongoing hospitalisations. And for Rod Dearly and his family, Father, we pray that you will comfort them in the loss of their dad. Father, more than anything, we just thank you that he was one of your children and he's now heard that, that, that beautiful phrase that we all long to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And Father, for many others who are struggling in our church and our broader society, uh, for those who are harmed by the evil that is in our fallen world, Father, draw near to them. Father, we pray your Holy Spirit will remind them of the love that you have for them. We ask that you would bring your justice to bear in this cruel, unforgiving world where often it seems that the selfish and the abusive ones are winning. Help us to lift our eyes to you. Uh, help us to be comforted by the knowledge that you are working all things and your plans are good and your plans will never fail. Lord, as we have a number of things happening in our church, exciting outreach events, Good News Week and the like, we pray, Father, for the various teams who are putting together preparations Father, we pray that you will help them to work together harmoniously. Help us to remain unified in the spirit, in purpose. Father, we pray that for each one of us here, we will be reminded of the great privilege that it is to be called to serve in your kingdom. Help us to serve selflessly and wholeheartedly, knowing only what we do for the kingdom will really have any lasting value. And lastly, Heavenly Father, we pray for Tim as he 
preaches today, Lord, may your spirit work in him. Lord, help him to bravely preach your word. And for each of us here, Father, help us to accept it with open hearts, a desire to love you and serve you more fully. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Donna up now, and she's going to read three readings for us today. It's an exhausting task. Thanks, Donna. Hi, everyone. Um, I have no good life hacks for you, I'm sorry. Um, But as Matt said, we don't need life hacks. We have the Bible. So um, the three Bible readings uh, I have today, the first one is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. Um, Then we're going to start to look at the book of Proverbs. Um, But first, we'll have a conversation, hear about a conversation that Jesus had with a man about the way to find life. So just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother, and love your neighbour as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother, or wife or children, or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. The next reading is from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. And this is the introduction to the whole book. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behaviour, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, for sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The final reading is from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 23. And this is one of the many conversations that Father has with his children in the book of Proverbs. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honour you. She will give you a garland to grace your head, 
and present you with a glorious crown. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way, for they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Thank you, Donna. Hello, everyone. My name's Tim, if I haven't met you. Um, I'm part of the pastoral team here at the Lakes, so it's great to be with you. Now, they've worked out through some kind of analytical um, sourcing that there's a classic song that is played on a radio station somewhere around the world every seven minutes. So I reckon there's a good chance you know this song. Let me just play it for you. I reckon most people know that song, Hotel California from the Eagles. Uh, Don Henley and Glenn Fry, they wrote that song reflecting on how their life had looked one way, but then over time they realised that there was a lot of illusion in what they had been chasing. And so as the lyrics said, they capture starting on a dark desert highway and then seeing the shimmering lights and there's a, a dazzle and an attraction and they pull over, they come to this Hotel California. There standing in the doorway is a lady. What a lovely face. What a lovely place. She welcomes them to the Hotel California and takes them down the corridor. Now, every time I hear that song, I find it very haunting. It is a haunting song. But when I hear it, I often think of these opening chapters of Proverbs, where you have a father talking to his son, and he's at painstakingly wanting the son to see what is an illusion and to not make the wrong choices, to not go down this corridor that looks one way to begin with, only to find that he has destroyed his very life. And so the opening of the book of Proverbs, where we'll spend most of our time today, is chapters 1 to 9. You may know Proverbs as little pithy sayings that sort of capture something about living at street level in life. Well, that sort of comes later in the book. There are nine chapters of this conversation of the father talking to the son. He wants the son to see uh, what, is, what is true versus what is fake. What is real versus what is deceptive and a lie. He wants the son to see that even though things might look like they will pay off in the short term, to slow down, reflect and factor in the long-term consequences. We're going to tour around chapters 1 to 9 a little bit, so I'll open it up. Here's a, a little bit of the steps that we'll make. The first movement is we're going to look at, we're going to spend some time just feeling the Father's push to get wisdom. And let me say too, that this, this ultimately, even though we're stepping into the shoes of this conversation between a father and a son, this is God, our Heavenly Father, actually imploring all of us as His children to get wisdom. So it's important that we hear that urgency. So we'll look at that. And then next, uh, we'll look at how to get wisdom. If it's so important, how do you actually get it? 
And then lastly, which we won't, be, we won't need to spend much time on this because I think it'll start to build and we'll get it by the end, but we'll just pull it together and, and actually pin down what exactly is wisdom. So first up, um, open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. Um, that's where we sort of put a pin in, in the one of the in sort of in the middle of these conversations. Uh, first up, let's just notice how the father is pleading, pleading with his son about the urgency of gaining wisdom and holding on to it. So verse one, listen, pay attention, keeps going on. Do not forsake my teaching. Verse 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget, turn away, do not forsake. Verse 7, get wisdom, get understanding. Verse 11, I instruct you in the way of wisdom. Verse 13, Hold on to it. Do not let it go. Guard it well. He is urging and pleading and sustains this, not just in this chapter, but throughout all the conversations towards his son to get wisdom. Why? Well, the father says things that show because the stakes are so high. Ultimately, we are talking about life and death. So come back to the start of chapter 4 and just scrolling through, uh, you come down to verse 4. He says, keep my commandments and you will live. Verse 6, because wisdom will protect you. Verse 8, that is where exaltation and honour will come from. Verse 11, it will lead you on the straight path paths. Uh, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Again, in verse 13, it is your life. And if you come towards the end, verse 22, um, the words of the Father to his Son, this wisdom, they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. The stakes are so high. The Father wants his Son to actually have life, to have prosperity, to have peace. And as you go through these conversations and even the Proverbs, you see that the Father will talk about um, observing how certain actions lead to certain outcomes. He wants to impart to his son that if you do this, then see that this will happen. If you do these kind of things, these good things will happen. If you do these kind of things, then pain and destruction await you. Come over to chapter 3. Now, you've got to stay with me and not be a sluggard, as the Proverbs would say. I know that we're moving around the Bible a bit, but let your fingers do the walking. Come over to chapter 3. Um, the first couple of verses. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Now, often when we talk about life as Christians, we often, our mind tends to just jump to heaven, you know, ultimately, um, that kind of life. But the father, when he talks to his son, life is much more broader for him. It's kind of on a spectrum. It starts now, but then it also reaches over into eternity. The father isn't just saying to the son, hey, um, just worry about the end day. He wants the son to find prosperity, peace, life, a better life now, to make the most. Even, even in a fallen world where there is suffering, there's sin, there's um, uh, not everything always goes the right way, he still believes that under God, you can observe patterns and he wants his son to observe those so that this life, even this life, will be the best life that he can have in this life. And so many of the Proverbs actually draw out how certain actions lead to different consequences. And over the next coming weeks, we'll look at all sorts of Proverbs. 
But you'll, you'll see as you go through, if you were to read through the, the chapters from chapter 10 onwards, you see there's all sorts of advice for just living in this life. Little things, little observations such as, you know what, if you're yelling and you live very close to a neighbour and you share a fence line, if you're yelling first thing in the morning, that neighbour isn't going to like you. And so you might want to start thinking about that and just how the different consequences could unfold from that. Um, there's lots of uh, advice on, you know what, if you talk too much in a conversation and not listen, then you'll probably find yourself without many friends. Um, both because you just talk too much, but two, you'll probably end up saying stuff that you will regret and they won't really like hanging around you. There's lots of advice on, well, on relationship skills. Simple things, like if you go behind someone's back and you gossip, they find out that's going to really destroy the relationship. If you lie in your relationship, that's going to destroy the relationship. So there's relationship skills, there's business skills, the, the art of a deal is dealt with, um, the, the foolishness of taking a bribe, the foolishness of having unjust scales or unbalanced scales, all this advice, because if you do these things, most likely the consequences will be good or bad based on whether it's a good or bad action up front. And so the father wants the son to slow down enough that he plans his life, even the day in front of him, plans his relationships where he is thinking reflectively about his consequences, to attack life planning. Now, I've had a number of different people tell me, just keep a lid on it today, let's talk about the things of God, because there was, a, there was an elite AFL team that did really well yesterday. But there's so many things in life, you can look at a football team and how just the planning sets you up for um, a more likely outcome. Um, observe life, whether you're watching an ant and how he collects his stuff and saves it up ready for uh, a later season, or whether you watch a football team and, you, and they work the, the pre-season hard so that they can have a crack at glory. But not only is the immediate future in view, the Father will talk about life sort of scaling up to where you need to be thinking about the consequences even past death. That ultimately, for life, for this father, under God, involves relationship with God. So even as you're thinking about maybe mere actions first off, this cause leads to this effect, the father implores that the son recognises that this character, this kind of relationship with God, whether you accept him or not, will lead to certain consequences into eternity. So you see in chapter 3, verse 4, how it starts to scale up that if you follow the way of wisdom, then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. And if you keep going through that chapter, there's lots of talk about living um, under the eyes of the Lord, under the fear of the Lord. Um, to recognise that the wisdom that God gives is like a tree of life. Very potent imagery that, recall, that calls upon the whole biblical story of, ultimately, life against death is found with God, the tree of life. Now, I want to take a moment to comment directly to the young people amongst us. I know we have a number of teenagers that are stopping in the church service um, today because of the holidays. Did you pick up that this is a father talking to a son? Um, now, this is just the way this conversation is being told. We're stepping into the shoes of a father and son, but it can be parents and their children. You could be a son or a daughter. Um, it all applies the same. But the father as he talks to his son, and as God puts this for us, for all of us to listen, there is this, there is this focus on young people. There's this focus on young people that they, in particular, 
need to be aware in their young life of the need to acquire wisdom and to acquire it early. So come back over to chapter 1, which Donna read. Um, That was where the introduction was given to, to give this promise of all the benefits of wisdom. But in verse 4, it says that wisdom will give prudence to those who are simple. Now, I'm not sure how you hear that word simple, but it's the, it's the idea of being naive. And maybe even naive is a bit of a, a negative word that we have. But uh, in the wisdom literature, naivety is not necessarily, necessarily foolishness. Naivety is to be inexperienced. And that's, that's just the truth of being young. Now, um, if you are young, it might be hard to hear that. I remember I hated my parents telling me that they knew better than me, that they had travelled this road before. Um, and particularly if they came back and said, I told you so. so. It's very hard to listen to that. But I implore you, if you are young, to, to hear God... God is levelling with us that we start naive. And if we, can, if we can be humble enough to accept that starting point and sit before God, sit before his word where we are willing to, as a naive, young person, to acquire the wisdom that he wants to give us, then you are going to have a better life. That is the promise. This is for... The simple, the naive, the young, to gain wisdom. But it doesn't just stop there. As you'll see in verse 5, it says that even for any of us that might think that we are wise or wiser, then let the wise listen and add to their learning. Um, Now, seriously, um, young people, teenagers, young adults, it's easy to dismiss this. The father, in, this fir- in his first conversation with his son, raises the temptation to just simply dismiss that. That's, that's part of being young. You know, really? Do they know better? They don't know my situation. They don't know what it's like to be me. So the father opens by saying in verse 8, let's read some of that. Chapter 1, verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland of grace around your head and a chain to adore your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for innocent blood, let's ambush some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole, like those who go down to the pit, we'll get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder, cast lots with us, we will share the loot. My son, do not go along with them, Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. there's this great temptation, particularly, it's for all of us, but it particularly pulls hard when you're young, to go along with a group that says, with us, we will find happiness, satisfaction and life. There's this great pull, and this is quite extreme, but it makes me think of something that I came across a long time ago, that C.S. Lewis wrote and he talked about this dynamic that plagues humanity called the inner ring and that is that we all stand, I think you'll have to excuse my drawing, I I drew this the other night, Um, we all stand kind of outside a group of people desiring to be long, I mean that's a natural thing but Along with that desire to belong comes the temptation sometimes in order to be accepted by that group 
to compromise. And C.S. Lewis talks about how there's usually lots of little subtle compromises that it starts off with, um, but then so many people, particularly as they get older, can reflect back and see how all these little compromises added up and they have found that they have done things that they never would have dreamt of doing. I can remember when I was younger, um, my dad was a school principal and I went to his school and so I had like identity problems. Like, I, don't, I don't want to be known as the, the school principal's son. He um, employed this young lady as a, a teacher and she happened to live in the cul-de-sac down the road from us um, and I think over the holidays as she was moving in, um, we got to know her and I thought she was great. She was awesome. Her name was Mrs. Martin. She even looked beautiful and so I just thought she was a wonderful teacher and um, she spoke to us like adults and um, she you know, hung out with us and I think she had some cool computer games and anyway, I just really liked her. But I can remember being in a class with her in a, f in a few weeks and in order to belong to a cool group, I started to literally abuse her publicly. I would swear at her, I would um, throw stuff at her and I can remember coming home at night thinking, I wish I didn't do that. And yet the next day, would do it again and again, and it escalated and it escalated, and, and soon I, you know, I got in a lot of trouble off my father. But here I was, one night, sitting at my kitchen table with my dad and this teacher, and she was just in tears, absolutely destroyed. And I realised what I had done. Now, I've got so many other stories like that, stuff that I wouldn't want to share publicly. Um, but it's just, I'm sure all of us have these little things that just you move and you compromise and it can add up. It might be at work, you're happy to lie a little bit. Um, sometimes it might even be a neutral thing. It might not be a, a kind of moral thing, like am I going to lie or not? But you just give all your time in order to be accepted by a certain group that you trade out your family or you trade out um, other important things. It's a huge pull and C.S. Lewis, such a wise man himself, he said the, the great deception is that once you get into the circle, you find that there's another circle inside and uh, forever you are pu being pulled to belong. And the father here wants to warn the son, such is this pull, um, don't get sucked in. Don't get sucked in. And one last um, word to the young people amongst us, teenagers and young adults. There's, there's often a saying that some, sometimes older folks might even say this in your face, oh, you can't put an old, shed on, uh, an old head on young shoulders. I think the book of Proverbs, God's word actually argues you can. You can actually fast track your wisdom. You can actually fast track your maturity. You, you don't have to learn things the hard way. You can listen to people who have gone before you, your parents. You can observe the world and watch the outcomes for different people and make correct decisions. As our father says back in chapter 4 here, he says to his son, For I too was a son to my father. Then he taught me. You can fast track. You don't have to learn the hard way by listening to your parents and even more so listening to God's wisdom in his word. And now just a, a brief comment to parents amongst us. Um, did you notice that the father is present with his child? The mother is present. Um, they show up. These conversations are beautiful. This, this gives you a picture of parents walking and talking with their children. They, they haven't outsourced wisdom to tablets and TV and movies and friendship groups. They're in their life. They're walking and talking. Um, it's, it's not sitting down for a one-off conversation. It's not sitting down and just giving a list of rules. It's being in their life in such a way that you can observe the world with them that we can walk with um, our children and we can wonder with them. 
get them to wonder about the world. Uh, I sit down with Kale often, often we'll go and get a frozen Coke and just sit and watch people and just ask questions, not to them. And <laughs> but you just wonder, and it's, it's wonderful with your son. You see graffiti, you talk about it. Use what comes up in front of you. Whatever is happening in the moment, use those things, walk and talk, and talk about it in light of God being creator, owner, and ruler of the world, redeeming us. Um, let us as parents also not hide the real world from our kids. Sometimes we can feel awkward. Maybe there's experiences we're embarrassed or ashamed of. This father here seems to share with his son observations he's seen and things he's learned himself. And of course there's age appropriateness that we've got to figure out, but let us be vulnerable before our kids and not hide um, the consequences that can happen, even if it can be an awkward conversation. Okay, we've spent a little bit of time there, but we will move faster through these next couple of points. So, next, how do you get wisdom? If it's so important, and it's life and death, how do you get it? Did you notice um, with some of our readings that a lot of the language kind of suggests that it's very difficult to get wisdom? It's hard, it's elusive. You've got to go searching for it, you've got to find it. If you do happen to get it, you've got to hold on to it. There's great pressures, there's gravitational pulls going on. It's very, very hard to get it. As we read in Proverbs, though, Proverbs doesn't say it is actually hidden. On the contrary, it says that wisdom is out there, public. God is proclaiming it, both in his word and in observing the way the world works, so much so that it can be thought of a, a lady standing on the corner at a high point in the city, just yelling out, get wisdom. So it's not quite hidden, but what makes it so difficult? We'll come over to chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out at the city gates. She makes her speech. But here's one of the things she says. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke, then I'll pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen... When I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, so on and so on. But there, I take us to that point, there is that um, the wisdom writers recognise that wisdom is public and it's out there to be got, but what makes it so difficult to get is our foolishness. Or another word for it could be sin. The Bible tells us a big long story of we are fools because we have traded out God. Romans chapter 1 speaks about we have become fools and darkened in our mind. That is what makes it so hard to get wisdom, even if it smacks us in the face. Wisdom can seem like foolishness to us, um, but we are sinful and we like our sinful ways. It is very difficult to get wisdom. It's elusive and you've got this dynamic of sin, but sort of mixed up in it, um, sin is deceitfully alluring. Sin works in such a way that it actually looks attractive. It looks promising. It looks like it will offer life. And so in our foolishness, we stumble off thinking that we are gaining life. Throughout these speeches between the father and the son, he, he actually uses a picture of two women. And they are beautiful. Both women are attractive. And a son can resonate with that. You know, it's natural for a son to look at women and, and say that they are beautiful. But the father, very helpfully, uses this as an image to say, you have to look past the superficial beauty to find out which one is deceptive and which one actually is true beauty. And so it builds up into this metaphor where the father is imploring his son to fall in love 
with the true beautiful woman. To not be so stupid and accidentally go down and fall in love with a wayward woman. So come with me to chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. Um, he is a father walking with his son, and uh, you can almost picture that they're, they're kind of watching this take place. Verse 7, 7, verse 7. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house, at twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares. At every corner, she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him and with a brazen face said, Today I have fulfilled my vows and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. Goes on to talk about the... Coloured linen, linens from Egypt, the perfume, um, and just the alluring attractiveness of what this young fella uh, is heading towards. So it looks, looks alluring, it looks promising, it looks like this is where satisfaction in life will be. But then the father makes a comment at verse 22, all at once he followed her. Like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. And further down, verse 26, many other victims she has brought down, her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Sounds like a dark desert highway, doesn't it? Um, and sin is so deceptive that uh, we as sinners often go really that's not life so when when people come to us and say get wisdom whatever else get wisdom at all costs even if it means trading everything that you've got actually that is the way to life we go really it doesn't look like it this actually looks like life. But the father is saying, no, even if you get to a crunch point where it looks like you have to trade all your life in order to get wisdom, it is worth it. The father wants the son to see past the immediate gratification, the immediate illusion to see the consequences. I have a picture here of um, Ship of Fools by Hieronymus Bosch. So he drew this or painted this uh, in the 15th century. It's a picture of fools, but they are enjoying life, um, food, pleasures. Um, I, I probably should have zoomed it in more, but maybe you could look it up and zoom in. It's got these profound images in it. One guy is climbing up the mast to dangling carrots. Um, people are paddling with a, a flagon. Um, you can see that they're kind of not aware of what they're doing, even though they think that they've got life. Well done. Whoever did that? Good work. Um, now, can you zoom out? Because I want to show... <laughs> um, up the top, there's this mast and a skull in it. And it's a profound picture because such is foolishness that they do not realise that they are actually being driven along by death or, or their destination is death itself. Our Lord Jesus, it reminds me when, when you think of um, get wisdom, whatever else, get wisdom, reminds me of our Lord Jesus who, who, who once said to his disciples, whoever wants to meet, be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So wisdom is elusive. Um, we are foolish in our sin. Sin is deceitful and it looks like life. And some, so much so that sometimes we just can't 
reckon with that equation, really we're going to trade out this good stuff, this picture of life in order to gain life. So how do you get it? Well, the gospel shows us that ultimately wisdom is a gift from God. In order to be able to see that this equation that Jesus says makes sense, you have to see that there is God as the ultimate reality. God is running this world and he will deal with sin and atone for sin, which he does through the Lord Jesus, and pours out his spirit, which gives us wisdom to accept that these things are true. And so we then come to these kind of passages in Proverbs and we can listen to them and and see the ultimate consequences, both for now and also eternally. Ultimately, wisdom is something that is given by the all-wise God. Um, That story that Donna read spoke of a a young man who couldn't trade all all that he had in order to follow the Lord Jesus um, the disciples, you know, well, even Jesus seemed to say that you can't do that trade. It's impossible unless God does something. It is possible with God. Okay, lastly, coming back, so what is wisdom? Well, I don't need to say much here because as we've travelled through, what we've seen that wisdom is a God-given ability to see through the illusions that come towards us, promising life but are actually death. God-given wisdom to see through the illusions to truly see how the world works at the ultimate level, to truly see the consequences of everything under God and to place ourselves under all that God has revealed. Um, That wisdom that says there is forgiveness and hope for life with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said so often, He who has ears, let him hear. Let him hear. So to finish, I'm going to play a little bit more of Hotel California, right? I'm going to cut to the point in the song where the illusion is shattered. Listen to the words, and then as the music trails on, I want to read the final, some of the final part of Proverbs chapter 9, um, and just let the song and Proverbs mesh these things together for us as we resolve to live a life of wisdom. So here we go. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being our Father, showing us the consequences of our actions, of our character. Thank you for showing what truly is and what truly happens. Protect us, Lord. Uh, We know we first have that through the blood of the Lord Jesus. And now by your Holy Spirit, as we seek to live each day, now and into eternity, may the all-wise God, who has all power and glory, Be with us, giving us wisdom forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, there are times, I think, in our sinfulness that we have headed down that road and down that path, and yet we have a confidence. We have Jesus. He has overcome. The grave is overwhelmed. And that victory is won. So we're, we're not victim of, we're not going to be conquered by uh, the error and the sin of our ways because Christ has redeemed us. Uh, and we have a confidence that we will rise when he calls our name. So let's stand and reflect on the hope that we have despite the sinfulness that we've had in our lives. There's a peace I've come to know 
Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won
Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still remain, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain. thanks and praise that by your blood you have paid our debt. Lord, that we can be confident you will raise us from the dead. Lord, we thank you that you took upon yourself our sin. Lord, you died my soul to save. Lord, may my song, may my lips forever repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him. Amen indeed. Thanks, James. Thanks, band. Uh, I hope you saw that at the end of chapter 9, or chapter 9 starts with an invitation, wisdom or folly. And so the metaphorical son or daughter, which is you, is told, if you choose to choose folly, close the book. Go away. Go to those murky depths. But choose wisdom. And then next week, read on. Let's continue our way through the book of Proverbs because we will dive more into that. And I pray you come back next week and together we can learn it or learn it anew or learn it in a different way. Thanks, Tim, for that great message. Uh, I do just want to quickly say the Good News Week flies and also serving flies. I've got some of those. So if you're interested in what came up on that video, please come and have a chat to me or Ruth is down the back there and she's got them up in the air. Um, we'd love to have you come on board or think about Good News Week and also don't forget the Men's Weekend and I've also been reminded that next week is uh, Daylight Saving so put your clock some direction, I'm not that. put it forward, put it forward or come to 10.30 service as the 10.30 congregation leader, love to see you there, no just kidding look I pray you have a great time together at Morning Tea together and a great week as well God bless
Like a tree that grows 